Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of the Arbury Road podcast with myself, Dermot Kavanagh, as always. This week, we've got a special episode. We're going to chat about an issue that's of the utmost importance all across Europe, and that is the ongoing housing crisis. With me, we have a very special guest, Mr. Christian Hochgraber, who is a member of the Berlin Parliament for the Social Democratic Party. And while he's not engaging in his parliamentary duties, he is a qualified attorney and expert in tenancy law. Christian, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you for having me and good evening from Berlin. Good after, well, good evening from good Berlin. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay, so let's dive right in. Um, for our listeners, would you be able to tell me in as clear terms as possible, what exactly is the housing crisis? Well, when we're talking about the housing crisis, we have to look at quite a number of topics, to be honest. So the housing crisis um, basically comes from a point where, on the one hand, we have people, we have investors, we have large funds who deal with properties, who think it's bricks, who thinks it's something that can be dealt with, like on a stock exchange or something. On the other hand, and that's more or less my perspective, housing is something that's a human right. It's uh, not only bricks, it's not only buildings we're talking about, but we're talking about the homes of individuals, the homes of people, where they live, where their children live and their families live. And um, that's uh, one of the reasons that uh, we have this, uh, these differences in the, in the visions and in the views of where we come from and what we look at. Now, if, um, if you are talking about a crisis, then a crisis is always, uh, there about something where we are having problems. And the problems we are looking at is that all over the major cities, there is not enough residential living space for everyone to stay in. Now, what are the reasons for this? Might be your question. Um, and there are, there are numerous reasons. Now, even if we look at the, at the population growth in, in, the, in the major European cities, I have, um, I have looked up the numbers for you for, for this afternoon. If we are looking at London, for example, in 1991, we had 6.8 million people living in London. Today, we're talking about 9 million people living in London. Madrid, I'm, I know I'm talking to you in Spain right now. Madrid, 4.9 million people in 1991. Today, 6.6 .6 million people in Spain. And if we're looking at Berlin, where I am located right now, in 1991, we had 3.4 million people. Today, it's 3.7. So the growth in Berlin hasn't been quite as large. But if we're looking at London and Madrid, that's why I pointed out those two cities. We're having a major growth in population. Um, people are coming into the cities because they're hoping for work. They're hoping to find uh, culture. Now, Corona hasn't made all this any easier, but um, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons. We have um, ma majorly large numbers of people um, who have made their personal decision that they want to find their luck, that they want to find jobs, that they are looking for culture, for freedom, for cities, which is why, why they are moving into the cities. Um, we're not talking about the, the rural areas, like in the flat land where people are moving away. That's not our problem today. Um, but we're looking at the big cities. And, um, and so if we're just just for example, looking at the numbers of Madrid, 4.9 to 6.6 .6 million people. That's quite a growth in, in the past years. And um, the, the, the buildings and the residential apartments or housing hasn't grown in the same way. So that might be one of the reasons or actually is one of the reasons that we're facing problems is the population growth. Secondly, um, before we had the Corona crisis, we had uh, we had a major financial crisis. If you remember, Dermot, all the things which uh, which happened uh, throughout the banking crisis, where um, a lot of people um, found themselves in a situation, and a lot of wealthy people, I must add, found themselves in the situation that they were fearing about the value of their fortune. So they wanted to secure the fortune. The the stock exchanges. And their points of view were not secure anymore at the time. Um, trading in dollar, trading in gold, maybe going to the stock exchange. No, they didn't do that. They went into buying real estate. Now, if I'm looking at the Berlin market, because right now I'm sitting here in Berlin, if I'm looking at the Berlin market, in those years of the banking crisis, we had so much money flooding into the city from investors from Cyprus, from investors from Italy and Spain a lot, um, where people were just thinking, how do I secure my money? How do I secure my wealth? And they bought and bought and bought. Now, 
these people, and I, and I said that in the beginning, those people don't look at real estate as something that's a home of people. They look at the real estate as something that's something to secure their money or something to make another fortune with. Now, that leads me to the third reason. If those people don't look at the situation of the individuals who live in the apartments anymore, they don't invest. They don't, they don't like, like generations ago, uh, an investor would buy or even inherit maybe an apartment or a building. They would renovate. They would keep the building up to, up to uh, the, uh, the state and, and fix things if they get broken. These investors, and we're even talking about huge hedge funds who, who buy uh, so much housing, they don't invest anymore. So they just buy the property and then they don't want to make their money with renting. They don't care. They want to make their money into keeping the property, hoping that the value will grow in a year or two, and then they sell it again. In those two years or three years, they don't invest anything. So there you can see, and I just gave you three topics, Dermot, right now, that there are a number of reasons which add up to the housing crisis. And um, to, to maybe frankly answer your, your question, the crisis is we don't have enough apartments. We don't have enough residential living anymore. That's where the crisis is coming from. Okay, thanks for that. So you've mentioned that they're in certain cities, and again, important to, to point out, we are talking about, as you say, the big urban areas, the big cities across Europe. You're saying that there's a lack of, of housing, and yet in, in a lot of cities, there are excess buildings and, and, and apartment buildings that were built and that were never filled with tenants. So the, the issue here clearly is, is to do with the affordability of these apartments. How can we have these corresponding yet completely contrasting phenomena occurring at the same time? We have an excess of, let's say, expensive housing that's just sitting there going to waste. And we have families maybe unable to pay rent, homelessness on the rise, and in other ways, a shortage of housing. How is this possible? Well, it's possible because we also have to look at the development of the income of those people who want to actually live in those apartments or in these houses. Now, if we're talking, and you mentioned it, Dermot, if we're talking about real estate that's built for very wealthy people, then yes, they, they don't have any problem affording a nice villa or buying a big house or buying a beautiful, fancy, beautifully renovated uh, apartment downtown Berlin, Madrid or Paris. But if we're looking about our average um, worker or a nurse, a policeman or a fireman, they can't afford these real estates. So what they, what they need actually is affordable living space. And um, that maybe even juggles a little bit with the first question is that the, the increase of the income of those people hasn't gone up in the same way that the rent or the costs for living have gone up in the past years. Now, if um, for if I if I may if I may just give you an example, and I'm, I'm just using Berlin because I have the I have the numbers right here. In Berlin, um, we as I said, we we currently have about 3.7 million people living in the city, and for those people, we have 1.9 million homes. If I may just say homes uh, to generalize. Now, the the general the average no not just the average net rent. Um, is around about seven euros per square meter. Yeah, now if you look at a, at a general German household, two parents, two kids, and a dog, that's usually the average, yeah, then um, you, you probably need something like 80 or 90 square meters at least, and you can do the math, yeah, it, it adds up. Now, um, if uh, we're looking at the, um, at the um, um, development of the rents, now between 2015 and 2017, they have gone up in average by 4.6% every year. Now, and that's only in, the, in those, in those, uh, in those uh, three years that I just mentioned. And the income or the salaries of those people, they just haven't gone up in the same way. Now that's up, that adds up to the housing crisis. Perfect. But that's much clearer now. In, in my head and I'm sure in, in some of our, our listeners' heads too. So we know that this is, a, this is a problem pretty much across the entire continent, across the entire European Union, but are there any differences in the way this issue manifests itself from one country to another? 
I believe so, Dermot. I believe so because um, the situation of people is not the same all over Europe. If uh, if we are just just stick, let's stick to the three cities that I have um, that I have picked with uh, where I have prepared numbers. Now, if we are if we are, for example, looking at uh, Germany in general or the major cities in Germany, what usually happens is that people they are like 18, 19, 20 years old when they finish high school and they start going to university, and they usually move out of their parental home at that time. And um, that's when at the age of 20, if I may generalize it a little bit, at the age of 20, these people are on the market for looking for rental accommodation. Yeah. Now, if you want to compare this to, for example, Madrid, um, um, you guys, you move out a lot later um, from your parental home than, than people do in Germany. You stay in your parental home a lot longer. And then also a little bit generalized, you don't rent, you buy. Yeah, so um, that's uh, that's quite a difference. Um, and uh, if I may, if I may add um, some figures in Berlin, for example, um, around about eighty-five percent of all the housing that is that is existent in the city is rental market. Yeah, so only only around about fifteen percent in Berlin are owned properties. And when I'm saying owned properties, I'm talking about uh, apartments which have been bought yeah, as owned flats, owned apartments, or single houses. Um, all the rest is renting market. Yeah, 85% is renting market in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, in Madrid, it's almost the other way around. Not, not quite, but almost the other way around. So um, um, the differences in the cities of Europe, yes, they are, they are existent because there are different habits of when do we move out, do we buy or do we rent? And um, that is actually quite a difference, yes. Perfect. So I, I, wanna, I wanna focus on Berlin um, because that's where, where you are obviously and where you have the most, the most information. You can, you can make things as clear as, as possible. But first, I just wanted to make a quick mention. You've already referenced the role some of these vulture funds play, where they aren't paying any attention to the renters. They aren't investing anything. They just want to own the properties and continue holding ownership. But alongside these kind of groups, what role have platforms like Airbnb played in the development of the, the housing crisis? Because I understand Germany was the first European country to to bring in some legislation on, on Airbnb. How has that impacted things? Well, that is correct. Now, if you look at, uh, at the major big cities, again, all over Europe, um, Europeans love traveling. I do, I do myself, I have to admit. I like going to Madrid. I like one of my favorite cities is Barcelona. Um, I love going there and, and, and hey, what do you do these days? You, you, you open up your, uh, your laptop, you go to Airbnb and one of those other platforms, there are a number of those, and you just um, check out where can you stay if you don't want to go to a fancy hotel. And uh, of course, hell yeah, I have to admit, it's much nicer to stay with um, some people who are locals, yeah, because you, you get the touch, you get the feeling of wherever you're traveling. But um, if you're if you don't look at these things from the perspective of the traveler, but from the perspective of the people who actually live in these places day by day, year round, then these apartments that are rented out to tourists or to guests, they they can't go on the renting market. So every apartment that's offered on Airbnb reduces the number of apartments which are free and available on the renting market for the citizens of those cities. So yes, that, uh, that does make, make uh, quite an impact. And um, of course, uh, if you look at Berlin, for example, if you look at Madrid, those cities create a lot of tax income from tourists. And yes, tourists are welcome in all those cities, I believe. I can say that for Berlin, tourists are very welcome and I'm crossing my fingers that the Corona crisis will end very soon because if I go downtown, the city is pretty empty right now. I don't like it. So we want these people in, in, in town. They bring, they bring a lot of money, they, they bring tax money and it's important for all of us, I believe. But um, this is basically the, um, the question, how do we regulate this market? Because on the one hand, we do welcome our guests in all our cities. On the other hand, we have to look out for our citizens who live here year by year, day by day, 24 seven. And um, that's why in Germany, we have tried to regulate the Airbnb and 
if I may say, tourist renting market a little bit. Um, and and uh, what we actually said um, that in, in certain areas which uh, have a high number of crises, a high density of people living there, that it's not allowed to rent out to tourists if you because because yeah we have we have hotels we have um, those areas where you can do that but hey not in the inner cities of berlin not not in the inner cities of our cities that where we need the apart where we need the apartments for our own citizens yeah very very well put so let's let's focus in on berlin now um do you want to tell us a bit how the how the renting market is in berlin at the moment and there are currently some proposals for some some rather impressive changes to be brought in, I understand. Well, yes, um, thank you for the question. And I, I, um, I believe I have already tried to highlight where the problems are coming from. Um, so um, if, I, if, I may, um, if I may sum up again, we have a major population growth. We have a development in the renting prices that doesn't keep up, or uh, other way around, a development in the in the in the income of the people that doesn't keep up with the development in the renting prices, and um, that um, that's uh, actually becomes a problem more and more every day. So, um, in in the state of Berlin, which is one of the 16 states of the Federal Republic of Germany, um, we have uh, pretty much one year ago we have passed a law. It's um, as you can imagine, those laws, they're being fought by everyone who is on the side of the investors, on the side of the hedge funds and on the side of the conservative political parties. Um, and uh, this law is currently at constitutional court and we will probably have a decision about this law uh, in late this year. But uh, what we are trying to do with this law um, and it's called, um, I'm, I'm going to give you the German word, it's called Mietendeckel. So it basically is, is a cap of the rent. That's what we are trying to do because um, what, what we have, um, or, or the, reason, the reason behind developing and passing this law is that we have seen all those problems which I have described previously. And um, we can see that um, in, in Berlin, um, we have um, of, of those 1.9 million apartments that I told you about previously that we have in the city, um, almost 70% are owned by private, uh, by private owners and around about 16% of those properties are owned by um, uh, governmentally owned uh, owners. Yeah. And um, what we are trying to do is that for the for the for the time span of five years, we said we want to stop the increasing of the rent day by day, month by month, year by year. So for the for the for the time frame of five years, we just want to put a cap or a lid on the development of those rents and just stop it. Now that's basically very simply phrased the law. Mm -hmm. Now, what did we do in those five years? Because if we don't do anything, no magic is going to happen. In five years, we, we wake up and we have the same situation like we have nowadays. So the, the reasoning behind this law is that we said, hey, we need five years to breathe. We need some air. We need to breathe. We need to find ways to increase the number of apartments which are actually on the market. So the, the thing behind this is, five years, we're gonna build, build, build like hell. We're gonna build apartments and we're gonna build them, um, not privately owned, but we're gonna build them um, with, with uh, companies that are owned by the government, that are owned by the people, if I may say so, so that once we have those, uh, those apartments uh, built up and ready for people to move in, they still belong to the country. They still belong to the state of Berlin. We don't want to put these on the market. We don't want to put them on the market for those hedge funds or investors um, to, to just stop the development of the rent because we can only control the rent of those apartments that are owned by us. Now that's the thought behind this law. But as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, yeah, it's being fought at constitutional court. And uh, if we talk again at the end of the year, I'll give you the details of what court has ruled. Perfect. Thanks a million for that. So the rent caps that you've just you've just described in detail, obviously, that's a, it's a great idea. You know, it is this is something that could and probably should be implemented across the board. Do you have any other potential proposals that could be implemented maybe in Berlin, maybe here in Valencia, any in any city across Europe 
that could go away to helping remedy the situation and get us out of this crisis? How do we get out of this crisis? That's um, that's a question that so many intelligent people are thinking about, and hell yeah, I'm thinking about that too. Um, there are there are many solutions, and um, uh, it, it at the end of the day, it depends a little bit where you come from. Now, as as you uh, introduced me in the beginning, I'm a member of the Social Democratic Party, so I'm not really someone who's on the side of the investors and of the hedge funds, if I may say so. Um, my, my thought and my intention always is to find solutions for the people who are actually in need of a home, right? So um, if, um, if, if you were to come from a conservative side, you would probably say, hey, we need public funding, we need tax releases for investors, because only by building um, houses which are going to be governmentally owned, we're not going to solve the situation because the state will not be able to build enough. So that's that would be their reasoning, and they would say, "Hey, let's let's um, let's give the private investors because we need them at our side. Let's give them tax re releases. Let's give them public funding so that they also build." Now, from my perspective, I would say let's put all this energy and especially all this money into building houses, which at the end of the day are going to be owned by the government, because those those um, houses, those apartments, they won't be on the market. And they won't um, they won't be used as uh, as something that's that's a stock exchange trading thing, because we will keep them in our possession and in our property, and only if we have them in our property we can control the renting price. Of course, um, the state, even if the state is the owner, no different than a private owner, the state has to invest in houses because once they are built, after a certain amount of time, after 10 years, you might need some renovation, you might need to invest in a new roof after 30 years, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, also the state needs the rental income to be able to afford these measures, but we're not going to put these buildings on the, on the exchange market and we're not going to trade them or, or, or deal with them as something that can be spent calculated with. So I believe that's um, that's really one of the major key points is that um, we need to increase the number of uh, housing, the number of homes, the number of apartments which are actually available. Now the other thing, and I mentioned this in the beginning, is um, how, how do we look at the, um, the increased people who move into the cities? I have given you the numbers in the very beginning and what's the reason behind this? I've give, I've, I think I've given you some of the reasons, but um, this, this of course um, leads to problems in the rural areas because they don't have any population there anymore. Now, maybe a second idea would be to make those areas a little bit more attractive for people to stay there to stay where they come from and to make it attractive for them to build a future, to build their families in those areas and not flood into the cities as much as they have been in the past years. And I've given you the numbers between 1991 and today. Um, but don't, under, don't misunderstand me, please, Dermot. I am nowhere of saying we want to keep those people out of the cities. If that's what they wanna do, then that's what they wanna do. And we'll welcome them here, of course, and we'll solve their problems sooner or later, I'm pretty sure. Oh, don't worry, there was there was no misunderstanding there. <clears throat> and it is it is worth worth clarifying that even though as you as we mentioned at the at the top of the show, we are focusing on the cities. Of course, rural development is just as important as as urban development, regardless of the of the, the sector we're, we're talking about. So here at Ivory Road, we're always looking for better European integration, better European cooperation, and generally the same rules applying to, to European citizens, regardless of the member state they're in. Do you see it as a plausible idea for the EU to implement uh, a European level housing policy that could remedy the situations in various member states? Well, Dermot, I couldn't think of anything better. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, we have uh, we have just uh, or we are we are still in the middle of the Corona crisis and and one of the things to be very honest that really shocked me in the Corona crisis is that all the borders have been shut down again. Um, now I remember I remember um, uh, many years ago when I was uh, uh, on on October in October 1990 I was uh, celebrating the unification of of Germany. Um, years later, I was celebrating when Poland, our neighbor country, which is half an hour away from Berlin, 
became member of the European Union. I couldn't think of any, anything better that has happened in our generation than the European Union. It secures wealth, it secures freedom, and it secures security for all over Europe, for all the people in Europe. And um, never in this continent, we have had uh, a decade or decades, I must say, of peace for so long, like we've had since the, the, since the ending of World War II and the beginning of the European Union. So yes, the European Union must learn to speak with one voice in many, in many positions. And this includes the, the housing development and how do we deal with our people when it comes to one of their most valuable human rights, their homes and where they live with their families. Well, I couldn't have put that any better myself. Christian, I think we're going to leave it there. That's a, a really nice place to leave it. Uh, thanks a million for all the, the brilliant insights there. I know I have a, certainly a much clearer, clearer view of the housing crisis now. I hope our listeners do too. So thanks a million for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Greetings to Valencia.